Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are. Uh, I am uh, Imam Waikid from uh, the Liber Institute in Egypt. I am a uh, hepatologist and a viral hepatitis specialist in Egypt. Uh, I'm happy to uh, share uh, this webinar with two eminent uh, professors of hepatology, world leaders in the field of viral hepatitis. Professor Maura Denbri is a professor at uh, the Medical Center uh, in the uh, University of Hamburg, Eppendorf, and she leads the research viral uh, research group in viral hepatitis, and she's a member of the executive board of the German Center for Infectious Diseases. Uh, professor Massimo Livrero is a professor of medicine at the University of Claude Bernard in Lyon, France. He leads also a research unit on epigenetics and genomics of hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, uh, in the Centre de Recherche on Cancerologie de Lyon in, in Serm, in France. Uh, two uh, housekeeping notes, or uh, some housekeeping notes to start with. Uh, first, this webinar is recorded. And uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A uh, part of the uh, Zoom app. Uh, all your questions will be uh, seen and uh, uh, answered uh, in, in, in the discussion after the end of the four presentations. Uh, uh, I, I would like to introduce the uh, Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. Uh, the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination started in uh, 2019, four years ago. It aims at, uh, at connecting uh, different programs uh, for, for hepatitis elimination globally, uh, uh, providing evidence-based and technical assistance to uh, programs that need technical assistance, especially low- and middle-income countries. Uh, it, it also uh, aims at building an evidence base and uh, increasing the knowledge of the status of viral hepatitis and viral hepatitis elimination in different countries and the progress along the track to eliminate viral hepatitis. And to realize a commitment in global hepatitis elimination efforts worldwide. Uh, you, you can visit uh, the website and you'll have you'll find more information you'll find a lot of information on hepatitis status and the elimination status in uh, di different uh, countries all over the world i will hand uh, now to professor uh, maura, maura dingri to uh, introduce the uh, ice hbv uh, program and introduce the first speakers maura Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wacht. Thank you for the very nice uh, introduction to this webinar. And I'm also honored to uh, uh, shortly present ICE HPV, so the International Coalition to Eliminate um, HPV, which is actually is an international, is a multidisciplinary coalition which aim at uh, connecting the research community around the world. So thus the group is made mainly by leaders in hepatitis B and D virology, immunology, and clinical research. Can mention briefly that our aim is uh, to contribute to the elimination of chronic hepatitis B and D uh, as a global public health challenge, uh, both by fostering the um, international research uh, collaborations and also by engaging stakeholders, key stakeholders in order to increase uh, disease awareness and also to improve uh, the accessibility to therapies. So I would say that um, the sake of, for the sake of time, and uh, I, we, we can move on. And regarding the uh, today uh, program, um, I think we have really mm, here uh, four outstanding and well-known uh, speakers that will give short uh, presentations. We have Maria Buti, which, who will start uh, talking about the burden of HDVs as from the epidemiological uh, perspective. Um, and uh, we will follow with um, Professor Anna Wedemeyer for talking about the treatment indication and current options for advances in therapy. Uh, we'll follow by Pietro Lampertico from Italy, um, telling more about the progress and lessons that we have learned so far uh, working with the entry inhibitor bulivertide. 
And uh, the fourth presentation will be given by Fabienne Zolin, who will launch uh, the, the, some aspect and question about what are the main challenges in testing uh, for hepatitis um, T virus. Um, we will try to actually keep uh, uh, all the attendees are welcome, of course, to uh, place the question in the chat. If there are not really urgent questions, we would uh, prefer to uh, discuss, uh, to save the, the, the question made to, uh, for at the end of the presentations, when we will have a very interesting uh, roundtable discussion, um, because we will have the contribution uh, of uh, Professor Stefan Urban from Heidelberg, Germany, who actually is the uh, the person who discovered and developed the entrinivator boulevardide. And we have uh, outstanding contributions um, from the different panelists around the world. We have Dr. Naran, Naran Cercale uh, Dastori from Mongolia, um, from the Oman Foundation, uh, Richard jo Johum from Cameroon, Anna Krambis, uh, and Manal El Said uh, from Africa. So I think this is a very nice round table of panelists uh, to discuss the main challenges for uh, uh, achieving uh, a, a cure for HDV and to see what are the global uh, challenges. Say that, I think we can uh, now move on. Looking forward to the first uh, presentation, which as mentioned already, will be given by Professor Maria Buti. Uh, just to mention briefly, uh, she's a well-known hepatology uh, professor of medicine, work at the University Hospital uh, Vallebron in Barcelona. Actually, she has been working in viral hepatitis field for many years uh, and focusing particularly in the diagnosis and therapy for hepatitis B, C, and D. Um, she also is the chair of the Secretary of Public Health at um, ESL and associate editor of Journal of Hepatologies. I think she has made so many uh, outstanding uh, publication contribution to the field that um, doesn't, she doesn't need really further introduction and we are just looking forward to hear her presentation. Please, Maria, Maria go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Maura, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am going to focus on the burden of hepatitis delta and the epidemiology. And uh, next, uh, here you have my disclosures. And let's start with the burden of hepatitis delta, the global epidemiology. And I would like to mention next three studies published in the last four years that estimates the prevalence of hepatitis delta among people living with hepatitis B. And the prevalence is very variable between 4.5 to 15%. And that means that approximately between 48 and 72 million of people could be infected with hepatitis delta. And you can see in, in the map, that there are countries with the uh, higher prevalence in, in red and, and others in, 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 in light uh, red or even orange, the prevalence is lower and it clearly depends on the introduction of hepatitis B vaccination. Countries with a high uh, coverage of hepatitis B vaccination has the lowest prevalence. And the highest prevalence are particularly in Africa and in Central Asia. And next. Next slide. Here uh, we can see the results of a study uh, performed by Mario Risetto showing that in red, the countries with the highest prevalence of hepatitis B also have the highest prevalence of hepatitis delta. But also it's important to realize that there is no data, no information in many countries. And probably uh, this is related with the lack of, of testing. Next. Another important point is that the prevalence of hepatitis delta, it's completely different depending on the risk of adhesion 
adhesion of this infection is much higher in people who inject uh, drugs, but it's also completely different in, in settings in the, blood, in the blood banks. The prevalence of hepatitis delta is lower than in those um, the pathology centers, particularly uh, the prevalence is higher in patients with liver cirrhosis and hepatosural carcinoma. Next. So there is a specific populations that have the higher uh, likelihood of having hepatitis delta that are patients with hepatitis C and HIV, that it's between six and 10 times higher than the general population. As I mentioned previously, in patients with cirrhosis and hepatosular carcinoma are more likely to have been exposed to hepatitis delta with prevalence between seven and five times higher than the general population. Next. The majority of studies in general, uh, in the general, in the prevalence of hepatitis delta have been done using anti-delta antibodies, but not all uh, patients with anti-delta antibodies have um, true hepatitis delta, only those with detectable viremia. And detectable vi viremia, it's uh, tested in less studies than anti-delta, and the prevalence of uh, viremia uh, ranges between 40 and 73 percent, uh, meaning that um, to better understand the burden of hepatitis delta, it's very important also to test for delta viremia. Next. These are data from Europe, from uh, different European countries. Uh, you can see German, it's estimated uh, 32,000 people infected in France, uh, 31,000 in Italy, 49,000, and in Spain, 69,000. But I think uh, this uh, data clearly overestimate the prevalence of hepatitis delta, because if you look at next, at different studies, you can see, and these are data from Spain, uh, you can see an important decline in the prevalence of hepatitis delta particularly in, for acute hepatitis delta. I can tell you this is all data, but we are continuous registered all the cases of hepatitis delta in my center. And we, we, we have seen an important decline in the, in the number of cases of hepatitis delta. We haven't seen acute hepatitis delta in the last of eight years. And now the majority of patients have chronic hepatitis delta. And uh, usually the patients now diagnosed with hepatitis delta are migrants or uh, local people of advanced age. And this is uh, the, the, the decline in the prevalence of hepatitis delta. It's clearly related with hepatitis B vaccination and improvement in the public health system. Next. Very recently, this study uh, estimates, it's a literature review that estimates the prevalence of, next please, that estimates the prevalence of hepatitis delta next in 21 countries and territories. And you can see here a uh, new data, data adjusted for geographical distribution, disease stage and special populations. And, the prevalence of hepatitis delta is much lower. It's 1.3 uh, of anti-delta antibodies. And probably 66% of them, the, the, these are estimations, have active delta infection. Next. Next, please. Next slide. And next, so um, in, in summary, the, two, the true global prevalence of hepatitis delta is unknown due to insufficient data. 
and there is insufficient data regarding uh, testing uh, because anti-Delta antibodies are not available in all countries, even in some countries like US anti-Delta antibodies are not registered. Also, the prevalence of active infection in the majority of countries, it's not very well known due to the lack of uh, assays to determine uh, the, the, the viremia. And finally, the prevalence of hepatitis delta changes in different cities and in different countries, showing that clearly we need better data uh, to uh, evaluate the prevalence of hepatitis delta. Next. A critical point next. And I think uh, Fabian Sulim will speak uh, later. It's a screening. And the guidelines uh, uh, recommend a screening for hepatitis delta. In the majority of the guidelines, um, the American guidelines, the APASEL guidelines, only for patients with risk factors or chronic liver disease. These guidelines are the only one that clearly recommend all infected patients with hepatitis B have to be tested for hepatitis Delta. And next, and I can tell you that now, ESL has released during the ESL Congress a specific guidelines for hepatitis Delta. And the recommendation is a screening, a screening for anti-Delta antibodies should be uh, done once in all HBS antigen positive. And those with risk factors need to uh, be retested for anti-Delta antibodies. Or those that uh, have um, a specific uh, clinical situations that indicates the need for testing for Delta antibodies. Next. I think this is an important recommendation, but the recommendations of guidelines, the application of these recommendations is usually very low. I can show data from um, my country showing that uh, um, in a retrospective study, testing for uh, uh, anti-Delta antibodies overall is is very low. Only 10% of those HBS antigen positive has been tested for uh, anti-Delta antibodies. Overall, higher in, in, in a clinical setting, lower in, 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 in the general practice. We apply the reflex testing for uh, Delta antibodies. And using reflex testing, we can increase the number of cases diagnosed with hepatitis delta. There is a five-fold increase in the number of cases uh, diagnosed. And for me, what is really important is that more than half of these individuals didn't have risk factors for hepatitis delta. Next. An important question is if it's cost effective uh, to do reflex testing. And these are uh, new data presented at ESL Congress uh, showing that uh, reflex testing is able to reduce uh, the rate of liver cirrhosis, liver decompensation, hepatocellular carcinoma, and liver death. Uh, we apply reflex testing in uh, it's it's a uh, it's a Markov model uh, looking at the application of reflex testing in all uh, in all my country, and we can see an important reduction in liver related complications between uh, 30 37 percent, and also we show that is cost saving to do reflex testing once a uh, time for uh, every people uh, living with hepatitis B. Next. Let's move now to the clinical uh, consequences of uh, hepatitis delta infection. Next, please. Next slide.
sorry, but it's uh, it's a delayed. Uh, uh, so this is the algorithm for the evaluation of hepatitis delta. So all patients need to uh, to be tested for viremia, and those with viremia, it's important to assess the liver damage. So now looking at the clinical uh, consequences of hepatitis delta, next. Next, next please, next, next, one more. I don't know what happened, but we are going back. There is the problem with the connection perhaps, huh? because we are looking at increased risk of long-term consequence of viral hepatitis. Uh, okay, so probably it's a, it's a problem of connection. Sorry please keep this. in mind the time. Yeah. Okay, next slide. For us, one back. Okay. So patients with chronic hepatitis uh, delta have a higher risk of presenting uh, complications. The risk is uh, it's higher than those more infected with hepatitis B. The risk of cirrhosis is two or three times higher for hepatocellular carcinoma for hepatic decompensation, even for liver transplant and mortality. And next, ability of developing clinical events, it's clearly associated with the persistence of viremia. This is a study uh, that patients with hepatitis delta were followed for more than 19 years. And we can see the factors associated with a worse outcome are persistent delta viremia uh, and also um, men's cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis and We have lost uh, Maria. I'm afraid we lost Maria. I'm afraid, yes, because the problem is that we were looking at the right slide, but she was uh, asking for going on because uh, she didn't see the, the slide going uh, going forward. That's a pity because we have a yeah. connection now. <laughs> Don't know what happens. I only see the names of the panelists. No, because she, we see... Uh, longer that probably she has a problem with the connection yeah yeah maura can we uh, maybe should we suggest to, to if we don't get our faster back to you have to let's make wait, a break let's wait for a second because i saw her uh, appearing again oh she's back now, now. now she's back uh sorry so, sorry for the problems with the connection uh nothing perhaps... you can do about yeah, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps I can finish without the slides because there is some issues with, with the yeah. slides. So, so we see them. Yeah, but, but there is a delay and I am not able to, to see the, my slides. But I would like to finish just saying that hepatitis delta is still an important uh, cause of liver transplantation. And in a recent study uh, presented at the last ISL meeting uh, by Patricia Burra, that is the Italian experience in, in, liver, in, in the liver transplant setting, uh, approximately half of the patients transplanted for hepatitis B had also anti-Delta antibodies. So uh, even in countries with uh, uh, with hepatitis B vaccination, uh, hepatitis delta continues to be an important uh, cause of liver transplant. So in summary, we still have a lot of gaps in the prevalence of hepatitis delta. Hepatitis uh, uh, delta screening by reflex testing can help to improve the data on the prevalence and the burden of the, of the disease. It's important to remind that hepatitis delta is the most severe uh, form of viral hepatitis and the presence and persistence of viremia is associated with the worst outcomes. Thank you very much and sorry for the problems with the connection. 
Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I think we got the most of the presentation really, so nearly everything, so don't worry. And I think we will uh, move on for, um, with uh, Professor Wedemeyer. Uh, so uh, Heiner Wedemeyer actually is the director of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Endocrinology at the Hanover Medical School in Germany. Uh, so as physician, clinician, uh, but I can just mention that he has also worked as a research fellow at NIH um, in Bethesda in the earlier times, and then moved back the, to Germany. Uh, just, um, well, is re de definitely clearly an expert in immunopathogenesis, hepatitis B, C, and D viruses. And what must be mentioned also here is that being involved as investigator in really many different uh, uh, phase uh, one to four clinical trial of antiviral drug uh, immunotherapy for viral hepatitis. And I played, I think, a main role also in conducting the, especially the first uh, boulevardite trial synchronic hepatitis D patient. So please, uh, Heiner, the stage is yours. Uh, uh, with, and we are looking forward for your presentation. Okay, here we are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maura, for involving me. Um, it's a great honor and it's, uh, I'm really happy to see that you guys are putting Delta on your agenda, uh, the forefront, um, uh, which is obviously an extremely um, important uh, topic. Um, you asked me to uh, present on current options of uh, therapy, including adding interferon. That was basically what I'm asked for to present. Um, but before starting, uh, this is Hanover Medical School. Let me invite you all to, uh, if you want to know more about Delta, about this, uh, to the second uh, international Delta Cure meeting. Uh, Pietro Lambertico uh, was um, inviting us to Milan last year, which was, I think, extremely successful. And this webinar also already highlights how important Delta is, that there are many, many questions. And it's really great that we can discuss some of these questions here during this um, symposium. So I'm, I'm really happy uh, uh, and uh, please consider to visit us in Hanover uh, for the second meeting. It will be very nice, golden October in Northern Germany. These are my potential conflicts of interest, which includes companies developing drugs against both hepatitis B and D. And I have to thank my long-term collaborators in Hanover at the Hepner Study House and also Chihan Yudaidin. Um, uh, Maria mentioned already that we have new times in Delta. We have uh, a new easel clinical practice guideline, uh, which was released uh, during easel uh, on, on the Saturday of the meeting. And I think this is really uh, a landmark document. It's for the very, very first time that an international association um, uh, published a practice guideline on Delta specifically. And I can tell you that this was a hot discussion among the panel, uh, as um, obviously not on all topics, we, we have, let's say, long-term outcome studies, randomized trials. So this is really a clinical practice guideline trying to uh, give recommendations even in the absence of very high level of evidence. So uh, read it, criticize this, send um, uh, your comments, which I think is... Um, is important because obviously a guideline is only as long as well as until it has been published uh, and we have to work on the next version and to further improve this. The most important statement of this guideline was already mentioned by Maria. And that is obviously that um, all HPS antigen positive individuals should be screened for Delta. And I think that we should advocate, this is also what we are talking here, um, uh, on, which is the topic of the seminars. But then obviously, if you have identified a patient, it's really the question, what can we do for this patient? Uh, how can we, um, uh, what can we offer? And um, therefore, I like these recommendations, which are also um, very important and even strong uh, consensus, even though the level of evidence is not uh, uh, high rank. So all patients with chronic hepatitis B virus infection should be considered for antiviral treatment. I think that is a very strong statement, very important. 
Um, all patients with decompensated cirrhosis should be evaluated for liver transplantation. Um, and also very important, even if a Delta patient has already uh, developed hepatocellular carcinoma, this is not a no-go for antiviral treatment. Uh, and obviously we need to individualize uh, strategies for these patients, but I think strong statements. And now when you want to personalize treatment, how which patient uh, should receive what kind of treatment, it's also good that these guidelines highlight distinct factors being associated with a higher likelihood for a more benign cause of disease or a more severe cause of disease. And this includes host factors, but this also includes um, uh, viral factors. Uh, again, uh, you see many question marks on these slides. Uh, this is what we have, but I think it's a very useful document. Uh, so I have to advocate these guidelines. And then when to consider which treatment, obviously in some European countries, we are fortunate to have bulletite and Pietro Lambertico will uh, give you more details. Uh, but here, uh, the other point is in other countries, we only have interferon available. And then it's a question how to combine this. And therefore I really like this graph that um, if you aim for finite treatment, limited treatment durations, interferon is still the backbone um, of these treatment strategies. While if you have more advanced disease, if you uh, may even consider um, prolonged treatment or um, yeah, undefined treatment duration, then bulimatide in our European countries um, is the preferred uh, option at this stage. And as I will briefly mention, there are several other uh, drugs and strategies uh, in uh, development. And for those of you who are not only happy with um, European guidelines, uh, Lisa Sandmann and Markus Kornberg coordinated the German guidelines and an English version of this German guideline is available since June 20. Um, uh, in most of the topics, both guidelines uh, give similar recommendations, but there are differences. Um, and therefore, uh, this is quite interesting. So there's also a second document um, and the most important statement that all S antigen positive patients should be screened for Delta is also part of our German guidelines. Uh, when, we, when we think about personalized treatment strategies for Delta, uh, Delta is the devil, but we have to keep in mind that not every HDV infected patient may develop liver cirrhosis, liver cancer, um, and other complications. I think that's, that's an important statement from my side, um, and this has been shown in different trials, for example, uh, in the Swedish national, uh, in the Swiss um, HIV cohort, yes, we have more severe causes. Delta RNA is important, but some patients have a benign cause. And in the Swedish cohort, this was very nicely shown that um, if you have not yet developed cirrhosis over the next 10 years, uh, your likelihood to develop a liver related event is very, very low. Well, on the other hand, if you have already even compensated cirrhosis, Delta is really a malignant disease as uh, half of the patients within five years have developed or had developed at that time a liver-related event. So therefore it's important to really identify factors to stratify our patients. Will my patient belong to this group or to this group? And I think this is really something we all have to work on together. Is it liver stiffness? Can it help? Uh, and maybe yes, at easel, Lisa Sandman presented one abstract really showing that, for example, a cutoff of 15 kilopascal uh, correctly identified cirrhosis in nine out of 10 patients. So, which is nice, but obviously this data needs to be confirmed in independent cohorts. I skipped this. So now what, what can we do at this stage? Um, the question then is um, what to, with, uh, to do with our old HBV drugs and Delta? Should all Delta patients be treated with tenofovir antikavir? A question we have been frequently discussing during different um, meetings. Uh, the short-term answer and also the HDV guidelines say, yes, if HBV DNA is detectable, we probably should use it. But there's very limited evidence that we really improve long-term outcome. There are several single center cohorts. This was is an experience from the University of Essen, where I work before I moved to Hanover. And you can see here those guys that only treated with uh, nucleoside or nucleotide analogs have a severe or have a poor outcome. Uh, interferon treated patients have a better outcome, but obviously there's a selection bias uh, because the better patients may receive interferon um, or with better profiles. Um, but certainly 
Certainly, NUCs alone are not sufficient. And therefore, we have to go for interferon. Interferon has been used for many, many years. Um, we published the HIDID-1 trial 12 years ago. Uh, roughly one third to one quarter of uh, patients um, show um, HDV RNA suppression in the long term. Our therefore, we are adding does not really help. But we also published that there may be late relapses in the long term. So I won't be showing patient 207. And this patient 207 uh, experienced a relapse uh, here seven years after the end of interferon-based treatment. So um, we have to follow the patients, but I have to highlight that the patients being HDV RNA negative at the end of treatment, that these guys um, uh, had a clinically good outcome. So they did not develop uh, clinical complications. Prolonging treatment to two years does uh, not really help. Uh, it does not prevent relapse. as shown in the Lancet IBD paper four years ago. Uh, then you ask so if you want a personalized treatment, which are the factors being associated with response to interferon-based treatment. Um, Lisa Sandman summarized many of these factors uh, in, in Delta. Uh, so uh, I have to highlight that patients with compensated liver cirrhosis uh, have a, a reasonable response. So do not exclude cirrhotic patients from the, the option of being treated with interferon. The IL-28B genotype does not seem to be a strong predictor of response in Delta. Viral genotype, some very weak data that genotype 5 may be associated with a slightly better response from France and from King's. Um, but uh, this may be biased by patient, other patient factors. Viral load obviously is a good factor. Low viral load is better than high viral load as for other infections. Um, let's say personalized response guided treatment with viral load during treatment may have some benefit. Viral dominance patterns um, are not really something that, that is, can be used in clinical practice. And there may be even other factors like immunological markers. Um, and um, let me just tell you that, for example, also HBV markers like correlated antigen levels have been uh, studied in Delta, may be used as response factors. So there are, if you use interferon, look to the literature, this uh, paper is recommended to you. One last re remark, um, uh, use also, when you use interferon, the most sensitive assay available. Uh, for example, if you use a more uh, uh, sensitive assay detecting low viremia, then your risk to the experience a relapse after the end of treatment is much higher. Uh, so this is when we when we retested the old samples where we used an in-house assay with a more sensitive assay. We identified patients with low viremia, and these guys had a higher risk for a relapse, which you should consider in this context. Bolivertide, Pietro will mention this. Uh, it's approved in Europe. Uh, we have uh, the short-term trial, Lancet uh, ID, published in January. Uh, we have um, the New England Journal paper with a phase three trial, which was published uh, in June. And Pietro will show you the respective data. It's certainly an option which is available. Um, I will skip for time reasons, Maura, uh, some slides. Just to let you know that uh, other ideas are in clinical development. Lorna um uh, is uh, the prenylation inhibitor, uh, which uh, can be used also in combination with interferon. Uh, we saw here uh, data of uh, the largest trial in Delta ever uh, being presented at EASL. Uh, they are publicly available since the press release in December 2022. Lonafenib um, alone or in combination with interferon. These were the data that we uh, saw also in EASL or during EASL. And you can see here that uh, with Lonafenib treatment alone, you have this loss of response during treatment. Um, some kind of breakthroughs. Uh, there is a, an additional synergistic effect if you combine both drugs, interferon and lonafenib. Um, and uh, this is certainly something which needs to be followed. Off-treatment data were presented um, uh, by the in, in Vienna, uh, which is interesting that post-treatment treatment week 24, there were, uh, let's say, the response numbers were 
largely maintained, which is, I think, interesting. So off treatment, we did not lose many patients, but also here we need to understand which patients will in the end benefit from this treatment. We have data on nucleic acid polymers. I do not have the time to go in detail here. Uh, we saw these data frequently um, uh, presented uh, 10 years ago for the first time, and we have additional case reports presented during recent meetings uh, and case series, which are quite interesting, and we may discuss later during the discussion. And lastly, as iRNAs against HPV are also explored, I had the privilege to present uh, during ESL uh, the uh, REEF-D study results, and you can see here that S antigen, if used as RNA, are also declining in delta, and that is very important, this parallels HDV RNA decline, even though these patients still have a high S antigen level in absolute levels, they lost uh, or they reduced HDV RNA, but this was associated with significant ALT flares early during treatment, but in the long term, these patients uh, benefited and uh, you can identify a subgroup of patients with low S antigen levels, uh, which did not experience these flares. These are the blue guys here and they had really long-term benefit from these treatments. Um, and uh, so, Maura, let me finish here. So I think um, PEC interferon is still the standard of treatment for hepatitis D for most patients worldwide. Pietro will address some boulevardite-related questions. Additional new treatments um, are in clinical development, but what is quite clear for Delta, we really need personalized management approaches. I think that's good. there will not be one size fits all for every Delta patient. And again, if you want to discuss these options, uh, we invite you again to Hanover in October. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Aina. Wonderful. Uh, by so putting together cool. a lot of this uh, <laughs> news, important information, particularly the meeting in Hanover. No, not all. Fine. So, uh, Massimo, you take over. Yeah, I take. Uh, I take the. I the see list. some question, but I think we can we can wait for them. Uh, yeah, I, I was to see the entire presentation. Yeah, I was monitoring the question. I think that we can uh, go back to them at the during the general discussion. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Pietro Lampertico that will give the next uh, talk on lessons learned from Boulevardide. Uh, Pietro Lampertico is professor of gastroenterology and director of gastroenterology pathology division at the University Hospital of Milan. And uh, he has a long lasting track of excellence in clinical management of chronic, uh, chronic viral hepatitis uh, patients, in particular chronic hepatitis B and Delta. And uh, he participated and is leading uh, clinical research in all uh, hepatitis, chronic hepatitis uh, um, diseases and uh, on also on the long-term outcome of cirrhotic patients undergoing uh, antiviral treatments, uh, in particular the follow-up of patients developing uh, liver cancer. Uh, after uh, HBV suppression. And uh, now is up to you, Pietro. Thank you very much, Massimo. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you see the slides? Okay, thank you yes. very much, Massimo. Thank you very much, Maura, all the moderators and the organizing committee, of course. So as mentioned by Heiner, I will cover in the next uh, 15 minutes uh, sort of summary of uh, Boulevardite data. These are my disclosures. So just to uh, make a strong point, I will cover only Boulevardite data, but as suggested by Heiner, there are many additional possible antiviral targets against hepatitis delta, um, already mentioned interferon, alpha, but possibly also lambda in the future, uh, siRNAs, uh, already showed some data from Heiner, lonafenib boosted with Ornavir, already another option, uh, nuclear acid polymers, and there are also many studies or some studies on monoclonal antibodies against S in hepatitis delta. So my job today is to cover only Boulevardide. Why Boulevardide? Well, Boulevardide has been approved by EMA, as you know, in 2020, a two milligram set pew uh, injection every day. is the first ever drug approved by EMA, not yet approved by uh, FDA, by the way. Uh, the mechanism of action is absolutely unique. It's an entry inhibitor. Right hand side, you see the mechanism of action of Boulevardide. Basically, by using this synthetic polypeptide, uh, 
the entry of the Delta virus into the hepatocyte is stopped uh, and uh, the spreading of the virus into the liver is also uh, stopped. Um, however, please remember in, in yellow here that bulevertide does not directly inhibit delta replication in the infected cells. So that's a very important point. The kinetic of uh, RNA decline is probably related to other uh, kind of variables, cell turnover, cytotoxicity, viral induce, or immuno elimination. So this is something I don't want to go into much details, but that's a unique feature of this drug. And this is something that we have learned in the last couple of years. What also we have learned in the last couple of years is the efficacy in terms of virological, biochemical, and combined response rates over one year of bulevertide monotherapy. And these are the data from uh, the registration trial, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Heine, Wedemeyer, red, red Bar, and five to four or five different clinical studies, real life studies in Europe, because this drug is available in Europe. And the overall measure is that we have learned that the virological response is about 70%, biochemical response about 40 to 50%, combined response about 40 to 50%. The good news is that the, all these responses are very similar in registration trial and real life data. A very good news is that the uh, uh, response in cirrhotics compensated cirrhotics is similar to patients with, without cirrhosis, with, with just chronic hepatitis, the good news. However, you see in, red, in yellow down here, there is a 20% of the patients with what we call a virological non-response. We can play with this definition, we can discuss on this, but this has been basically confirmed in many different studies. And also only 10, 20, maybe 25% of the patients actually over one year of bulevertide monotherapy will achieve PCR negativity. So why only this small amount or limited number of patients really achieve possibly the best endpoint in any therapy in hepatitis delta? And these are challenges from this antiviral therapy. Another very important point I'd like to make is there are the new data from ESO. Um, now, in, in the previous slide, I showed you the virological response rate, but I did not mention this antigen decline because basically there were no, or there is no antigen decline or antigen loss over one year. So this is not a short-term monotherapy. This is probably a long-term monotherapy therapy. And if you prolong therapy from year one to year two, these are the data from the 301 study presented for the first time at ESOL meeting a few weeks ago. Again, please concentrate in the green dark bars or two milligram monotherapy. And the message is very simple. The longer you treat the patients, the better are the combined response rates, some improvement of the virological response rate, and also an improvement of biochemical response. And also in terms of PCR negativity, you know, 12% uh, over one year to 20% over year two. So basically, the longer you treat with monotherapy, the better are the results. However, there is one challenge here. Although overall, the 10 milligram data, which is not approved dose, look very similar to the two milligram data. If you really look carefully at the PCR negativity data, there is some maybe indication that if you look specifically to this endpoint, maybe 10 milligram could be a very interesting dose. So the question is, is really two milligram the optimal dose of bulevertide monotherapy? And this is something, you know, is a challenging question. Probably we don't have enough data for now. What also uh, we know from the French study is that if you prolong therapy, bulevertide monotherapy up to year two, there is a progressive increase of the virological and biochemical combined response rate. So this is still true also for real life data. But in the French people, in the French core, they were also able to use a de novo combination with peg interferon. And there are strong data suggesting that from the biological and virological point of view, there is a strong rationale to combine these two drugs because they are targeting two different uh, kind of mechanisms of action and they have different mechanisms of action 
possibly with an additive or synergistic effect on delta. But there are very limited data, real life data uh, on this topic. And these data are suggesting that the initial virological response is better if you use a combination therapy. But if you prolong the combination therapy, actually the year two data are very similar to the year two data on monotherapy. So the challenging is any role for de novo combination peg interferon, any role for add-on interferon, which is the best strategy. Again, I don't think we have enough data to um, make a strong, a strong conclusion. Well, what we've learned from the last two years of bulevertide uh, being available in Europe is that you can use bulevertide in patients with compensated cirrhosis with or without clinical and significant ports of hypertension. This is data from ESL. We put together 167 patients, all with compensated cirrhosis from 37 different EU centers, Italy, France, Germany, Austria. And we showed a very good left side virological decline, even if it is difficult to manage patients. Three lock decline. On the right hand side, a very good biochemical and fast normalization in most of the patients, very good data. But the question, the challenging is really, the challenges are the virological response in individual patients. If you look at the range, the RNA decline goes from 0.3 logs only over three years to more than six logs decline over 96 weeks. So a huge difference. You might think that compliance is relevant, probably in some of the patients, yes, but I think there is something else. There is a significant uh, individual variation in terms of virological decline on bulevertide monotherapy. This is something that we have to really think about. And also another very important point is ALT response can be even faster than the virological response. And you know we have to think about the mechanism of action of this. And sometimes biochemical response is disconnected from virological response. And this is another very good point for hepatologists, but is challenging somehow. What we learned in the last couple of years, mainly from ESL, is that if you treat with bulevertide monotherapy patients with cirrhosis, and these are difficult to treat patients, you might see virological improvement, bioclinical improvement, but also improvement of albumin levels. And actually what we showed recently, very low rates of decompensation over two years in these patients, but no major changes probably of cancer. So for the first time, we start to see some clinical output, clinical endpoints on bulevertide monotherapy. This is something new. But what is also new from uh, ESL is the possibility, although this is off-label use of bulevertine monotherapy, to use bulevertine monotherapy in patients with mild liver decompensated, mild liver, mild decompensated cirrhosis, which means child B, significant decline of aremia, significant improvement OLT, with 27% of the patient with clinical improvement, and 27% of the patient with, with the improvement of ascites, no major issues in terms of safety. Again, please remember this is a bulevertide monotherapy in child B patients is off label. We need a study in this patient, in my view. What we've learned also from the last few weeks, uh, really on bulevertide monotherapy, is that this drug is effective and safe in patients with triple infection, HIV positive, B positive, of course, and Delta positive. And these are the data from France, looking at 14 patients treated over one year with excellent virological and combined responses, 50% PCR negativity a year one. These are the best ever result in terms of virological response on bulevertide monotherapy. Well, our French uh, you know, colleagues and friends suggested it was the first ever real world data, but actually in Italy, there is already one published paper already putting together 14 such patients, not only showing efficacy and safety of bulevertide monotherapy, but probably my view for the first time, a progressive increase of CD4, CD8 cells 
which is very relevant and very interesting. Again, what we've learned with bulevertide monotherapy for the last couple of years is very safe. It's very safe in uh, phase two, in phase three, for one year, for two years. It's very safe independently of the severity of liver disease. We do see a do those increase uh, uh, bile acid levels, but mainly and almost completely fully asymptomatic. And this is a good news. However, again, challenges for bulevertide monotherapy long-term, which are the long-term safety consequences or effects of elevated serum bile acids for one, two, or three, four years in cirrhotics. This is something what we do not know. And why the increase of bile acid levels is not is dose dependence, but not related to efficacy. This is something not completely clear. So probably the most important point uh, is, can we stop bulevertide monotherapy? Can we cure Delta without a strategy loss? And these questions will be addressed by the me 301 study, the registration trial that you know, all patients after three years will stop bulevertide monotherapy. But these data will be available probably in one or two years. So there are two studies showing that it is possible to stop bulevertide monotherapy. This is one case from Italy. I'd like to thank Marwa Dandri for doing a lot of virology on these samples. What we showed is that we stop after bulevertide monotherapy of three years. Uh, the patient remained PCR negative in the blood, but also in the liver, despite remaining as antigen positive. So it's possible to cure Delta with bulevertide monotherapy. But what is very recently is a brand new data, brand new study from Austria. I don't have the time to throw through the study, but what they did, they identified two patients treated with bulevertide monotherapy, rather short periods, and they remain PCR negative off therapy. Again, it's possible to achieve cure of Delta without cure of B if you treat with bulevertide monotherapy. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we had no EMA or FDA approved therapy for Delta for 43 years up to 2020. 2020 EMA approved bulevertide monotherapy, which is available in the EU. We have many data showing efficacy and safety in real life and registration and phase two studies. For most of the patients is long-term monotherapy, but long-term does not mean forever. I think, that we can stop some in some patients if they achieve PCR negativity. Combination with interferon could be very, very uh, important in selected patients. However, the drug also uh, uh, it kind of raised some challenges, some new questions, and overall, how can we optimize the efficacy of bulevertide monotherapy? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Pietro. I really think that uh, your presentation, together with that of Einer Wedemeyer, really uh, set up uh, perfectly the landscape of treatment for, uh, for Delta. After so much good research on Delta, we now start to see the, 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 the translation of this in, 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 in therapeutic advances. Uh, still many questions, but uh, really exciting times. Uh, now is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Fabian Zulim uh, for the next uh, presentation about the challenges of, uh, for HDV testing. Uh, Fabian Zulim is the head of the hepatology department at the University Hospital, uh, Hospital, um, Hospital of Lyon. He is also the head of the Viral Hepatitis Research Laboratory at the INSERM uh, uh, here in Lyon. He founded uh, in 2023, this year, uh, the Lyon Hepatology Institute. He served uh, when he was younger in the governing board of the uh, ESL uh, and uh, is uh, well known everywhere as one of the animating person for uh, HBV cure and actually coordinates the, the French NRS HBV cure task force and uh, uh, several international projects around HBV cure. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, is one of the co-founders of ICE. Uh, two years ago, uh, we, we were all there together. And uh, Fabian is now okay. your 
Okay, thank you, Massimo. I hope you hear me and, and that you see the, you, you see the screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, uh, thank you for the um, invitation uh, for this uh, uh, webinar on, on hepatitis delta, which is really, really important. So I will focus today my, my presentation um, on uh, more on the assays for HDV testing, because we've heard about all the issues regarding epidemiology and, and, and treatments, but there are still many questions uh, around the assays for, for uh, testing HDV. So we, we, we have HDV RNA uh, assays that are um, <clears throat> heterogeneous and and um, uh, and rely on on different methods, and we uh, we go through rapidly on on some of the issues regarding the uh, extraction of RNA uh, on the amplification of uh, uh, methods used uh, for for these assays, uh, and the fact that the virus is heterogeneous with with several genotypes. So so the all these have impact on the uh, uh, quality of the assays and on the uh, relevance of the assays for HDV RNA monitoring uh, during treatment, for instance. And uh, I will give also a, a, a few words on um, the screening of HDV antibodies that was um, uh, pointed out uh, very importantly that we, we need to, to screen uh, patients um, that are positive for, for HBS. So um, regarding the uh, HDV RNA um, assays, um, we have the uh, issue of the heterogeneity of these assays that are mainly uh, linked, but not only to, to HDV genotype uh, heterogeneity. And one uh, of the first um, interesting study came from the French group in, uh, in Paris who we try to uh, analyze the um, uh, and compare the different assays that were available at that time. So it was 10 years ago, uh, as you can see, um, uh, across uh, different clinical isolates, clinical uh, 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 genotypes. Um, and uh, you see here as a um, uh, just a, a summary uh, on, on the top panel, you, you see the different our loads that you can see uh, across uh, across genotypes uh, and across regions. So you see here Africa versus Europe and, and Asia, uh, where you see that their uh, vowel load might be uh, lower, uh, but uh, the e issue was uh, on the uh, bottom panel uh, was pointed by the uh, by these authors that. Uh, <clears throat> when the comparing different assays uh, across different genotypes, for instance, genotype five, six, seven, or eight, you could see huge differences uh, um, across these assays by uh, uh, almost two or, or more logs, uh, um, depending on the assay. So, so this is something that is really worrying. So, a lot of effort have been done to uh, to improve the quality of the assay so that we are uh, less heterogeneous. Uh, and important studies from uh, from Hanover uh, also um, uh, showed that it was you know not only genotypes, HDV genotypes that mattered, uh, but also the uh, um, the way the assay is done. So, for instance, they they showed that uh, uh, the automated nucleic uh, acid isolation um, could lead to um, vowel load and uh, underestimation, and they compared different uh, uh, extraction strategies with from manual to uh, to automated uh, um, uh, extraction uh, strategies. So here again, uh, uh, um, uh, a point of uh, heterogeneity in the in the assays. Um, uh, another uh, uh, point is that uh, we really need um, uh, to use um, the um, <clears throat> WHO um, international standard uh, so that we can have a, a correction factors uh, to to compare um, the, uh, the the results across studies, when, especially when they are using uh, different uh, um, uh, assays. 
uh, as well, uh, since, the, since the studies are also very heterogeneous in terms of viral genotypes ac across the world. Uh, an interesting um, study was done by, uh, uh, by the group of, uh, of Pietro Lampertico, uh, where they, they compared um, the different uh, uh, commercially available assays, uh, RoboGene, the RoboScreen, uh, and NeuroBio uh, uh, assays in, in patients who were uh, treated with, uh, with Mircridex. Um, uh, and by comparing these assays in patients undergoing therapy, uh, nucleotide therapy, they, they showed that uh, uh, RoboGene was the uh, uh, most sensitive uh, and reli reliable assay uh, for uh, HDV RNA quantification. Uh, uh, along that, um, that um, uh, strategy, um, you, several groups are trying to, to develop uh, new assays and with the uh, um, development of the new technologies such as the uh, droplet digital PCR, uh, it was a, an obvious application uh, to go for uh, HDV RNA quantification with DDPCR. Uh, and here you see the uh, one of, uh, example of a study from uh, um, the uh, uh, Italian group from uh, from uh, Torino, where um, they um, use a DDPCR uh, assay, their in-house DDPCR assay, and compared it to uh, to the RoboGene assay. And you see here what is important to do when you have a new assay is really to to compare the uh, uh, assay with uh, uh, what a standard. Uh, what we could call a standard assay, uh, and uh, to always use uh, a WHO uh, international standard to, to, com to compare. Uh, and just one, one example here on, on their study that they, they showed on the left-hand side, uh, a comparison between the DDPCR in red, the RoboGene assay in, in, uh, in gray, and in blue, uh, uh, in house uh, uh, classic RT qPCR assay, and you see that across uh, uh, samples, uh, you can see uh, differences uh, uh, that are quite significant because here you're, it is a, a log scale, uh, and the uh, uh, the impact um, might be obviously clinical when we are monitoring uh, patients under uh, antiviral therapy, and you you see here that between DDPCR and then the RT-PCR, for instance, uh, you, you see uh, quite significant differences in the evolution of HDV RNA that might uh, uh, impact the clinical management of the patient. So we have to be very careful with, with this. Um, and uh, thankfully, the, uh, the, the major uh, um, diagnostic companies are, are working on development of new assays. Um, and, and you see, here a, a few examples. One here is the uh, uh, the Abbott uh, group is develop is developing um, assays for uh, uh, HD, HDV antibodies and also for HDV uh, RNA to work on their uh, already existing uh, platform. So so that's uh, uh, quite this is quite uh, uh, interesting. And if Abbott is doing something on Delta, obviously you can imagine that Roche is also doing something on, uh, uh, on Delta and they are um, uh, also um, doing studies uh, with their uh, uh, assays to work on their, um, uh, uh, on their autom fully automated platform because this will be uh, an important point with the, uh, with the uh, big, uh, diagnostic uh, companies that uh, you can use a, a fully automated uh, process from extraction to amplification and, and, uh, and uh, to obtain the results. And again, I don't want to go through this in detail. It's just to, to say again that uh, when developing assays, uh, we need to be uh, extremely cautious and go through a very rigorous uh, analysis of the uh, uh, performance of the assay with probate analysis uh, uh, using uh, uh, studies on linearity and inclusivity for uh, HDV, uh, HDV genotypes. So 
So here we see that there are uh, improvements in, that are upcoming, which is really reassuring uh, for because we, as you've seen, you, we have few several drugs that are now in clinical development or and or available. So we we need to have very good assays to monitor our patients. Um, and I will finish with the uh, uh, screening assays. Um, so we clearly need. Uh, a point of care test for HDV screening because many uh, of the patients or, or the undiagnosed patients, uh, what we could call new patients, but they are un undi mainly undiagnosed patients. Um, they are mainly uh, migrants or, or vulnerable uh, patients, uh, and we need ra rapid uh, point of care tests for uh, for the diagnosis of uh, of Delta virus and. Here you see uh, a, a recent uh, study uh, performed done by the group of um, Stefan Urban developing the, uh, uh, such a point of care test. And uh, it was really, really important to show that you, you can go for it. Uh, and uh, HDV rapid test, and I'm sure we will work, I mean, discuss this in the, in the panel discussion, uh, seems to be extremely uh, uh, well performing and you you see here the uh, uh well the overall process which is quite a kind of classic uh, uh test but we, it had to be done and uh, thankfully they, they did it so you and you see here that you you can uh, detect hdv antibodies across uh, genotypes and uh and uh, what is very interesting is that you you can detect not only uh, delta antibodies but also hbs antigen so it's it's really uh, uh, suitable for uh, uh, screening of, uh, of people in highly endemic uh, uh, countries or areas. So uh, in, in conclusion, we, 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 have, we are seeing now uh, an improvement of uh, uh, assays for the monitoring of HDV viremia, which is um, uh, really um, critical for a, a correct diagnosis of chronic hepatitis delta and obviously for the monitoring of antiviral uh, therapy. Um, so we are uh, now um, going to, to have more robust quantitative assays, which is really good. And regarding uh, anti-HDV uh, antibody testing, uh, reflex text testing for all HBS carriers uh, is clearly uh, recommended, strongly recommended uh, by the ESA clinical practice guideline. Uh, and the point of care test for HBS and, and Delta is, is really important to be implemented uh, in uh, highly endemic uh, countries. So this will need to have uh, also screening uh, policies and improved awareness in, 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 uh, among the stakeholders. And with this, I will, uh, I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, uh, thank you, Fabian. Uh, actually, uh, you were able to uh, to uh, spare a few minutes uh, on the schedule, but we are late as usual. So um, there are some questions in the in the in the chat and in the uh, Q and A. But I propose that uh, um, the, the 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 different speakers can answer to that question in writing. Uh, or we can come back to them uh, later on. And I would like to, to go directly uh, to the panel discussion, uh, saying that uh, Fabian perfectly uh, set up the, the, the scenario, the, the landscape for discussing everything that is related to diagnosis and, and the screening for Delta. That is, was one of the main arguments that we wanted to, to, uh, to discuss in the, in the, in the panel. Uh, if I can have the, 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 the panel composition slide, please, Lindsay. Just, uh, uh, I, will, I will not uh, read the, 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 the bio because otherwise the 15 minutes uh, will go for that. So we have uh, Dr. Um, Dash Dori from uh, uh, Mongolia. He's, the founder, he's a medical doctor, founder of the ON Foundation that is doing a wonderful uh, job on all liver diseases and hepatitis and Delta. In, in Mongolia. We have Stefan Urban that does not need any uh, introduction. Next slide, please. We have uh, Richard Nuyum from Cameroon, Institute Pasteur in Cameroon, that is a, a, 
a, a virologist and uh, engaged in uh, in uh, in the in, the, in the African setting. We have Anna Kramvis that we all know uh, from South Africa. Uh, she's an expert on um, viral hepatitis, molecular virology, and uh, molecular epidemiology. And finally, we have uh, Manal Etzayed from Egypt that is uh, well known to all of us uh, for uh, all her work on chronic hepatitis, especially in the setting of uh, pediatric uh, patients. And uh, uh, let's go for, um, for it. Maura, you had some questions for the panel. You can well. go. Yeah, we can. Uh, I think the, the issue of trying to understand the, the, the main problem, the challenges that different country faces in screening, we heard about the reflex screening, et cetera, et cetera, and the new guideline that we have now. But we have the opportunity now to ask a um, representative from Africa and Mongolia, I would start with them actually, to give a very short say some sentencing, just one to sentence really. Um, uh, making the point of the situation in uh, in Mongolia and different region of uh, Africa. Africa is a huge country, obviously. So uh, it would be very important. Maybe, uh, Dr. Dastori, you can uh, start. Uh, we know that Mongolia has a very high prevalence of HDV. And uh, maybe tell us a little bit the screening situation and so on and testing what's going on there. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And, uh... Uh, we have, uh, as you all just stated, we have a huge burden of the disease. Um, so hepatitis B has been screened in wide uh, range of population. So we have screened 1.1 uh, million people already. The target is 2.2. And out of 1.1 million people, we have identified almost um, the exact numbers are, I think, 98,000 people with HBACG positivity. Um, according to the guideline, we are actually supposed to reflex test them for anti-Delta. Uh, but the problem with uh, not having a lot of uh, different qualified testing, um, also the issue of the funding, so we are actually not doing that from the health insurance fund. Uh, so the patients are actually paying out of pocket, uh, getting it tested, and a lot of them actually get tested. And one of the issue... Um, as um, indicated by, shown by the Fabian's uh, presentation that we have different testing results coming out, different results, and that patients are actually getting quite confused. Do they have the disease, not have the disease? Um, and then of course, Delta is not making things easy. So they are, we also need to do the HTV RNA and then RNA being tested in different labs uh, gives different results, et cetera. So there's a lot of, um, unknowns and a lot of, um, so for example, one of the issue really with the HTV RNA testing is one is the uh, expense and then the other is health insurance fund is planning to um, subsidize the testing, but it's been almost now three and a half years we've been still discussing because authorities does not know which one would be the right one to choose. So the robogene is incredibly high, so we cannot afford it. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the hospitals are using in-house testing. Um, at least the good things that we are now, um, most of the specialized clinics are using the WHO standards. So this is getting a little bit better, uh, but still these are uh, the problems that patients are facing and then clinicians are also not really having a good, um, hang a good handle on which one you need to take it as a diagnostic test, which one you, how many times you have to repeat it, uh, how long do you have to wait and what kind of the patients you have to see them more often, et cetera. So all of that uh, so much depends on the diagnostics. So I think it's very important, especially the uh, multiflex testing like HBSAG and Delta, if they can actually screen in one go, then would the cost actually go down a lot because HBSAG tested and then comes back again, another appointment, another time of uh, blood draw, et cetera, it gets quite costly. Uh, yeah, so sure. this situation in Mongolia. And to be exact, uh, on the viremia level is one thing, but that's what we will come back to the question also, if maybe a rapid test uh, might also facilitate at least uh, the first step of screening um, and then, of course, move on. Maybe can Stefan at the end add something in this direction. But perhaps we move on to Africa. Um, Richard, 
Johum, would you like to start and, and make a, a little bit a point of the situation? Or Anna? Um, okay, I think we just hear us, Richard? Yes. Otherwise, Anna, please go okay, ahead. Okay, all right. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, well, for Africa, I think at least for sub Saharan Africa, what we can say is as a poster to your daughter. Um, here in South Africa, we say that there's no HDV circulating, but I know anecdotally that there is. Um, we have no facilities for testing whatsoever. Um, all the facilities are in research institutes, in-house PCR, and there's one particular institute that's doing anti HDV. So we don't screen for HDV. We've just had a number of cases where the uh, clinicians felt that we needed to screen and we helped out as a research facility to look for um, RT-PCR. Um, the last uh, study that was done in South Africa for HDV was done 25 years ago, 1997. So there's definitely um, a need for more research. Um, we're also seeing a lot of uh, immigration from the north of Africa where there is more HDV coming into South Africa. So we're seeing movement of HDV in the country, but of course, um, we've either had to do it in-house here or send the samples out to Europe for testing. So there's definitely a need for data. We've also got the HIV context, which is something very important that we need to be aware of um, because the natural history might differ with the HIV co-infection. And of course, the uh, response to treatment would um, also differ in the context. Um, and it's also important that any new drugs or any new antiviral agents that are developed are trialed in Africa. We have a paucity of clinical trials in, uh, in Africa. I think in total, just for HBV, we've had 48 clinical trials in all the years on the continent. And that's very low considering that um, we have the highest prevalence. It's the only region of the world where HBV is still hyperendemic. And of course, we have the highest incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is what I have to say. And I think Richard will back me, um, I think, from the Cameroon as well. Yeah, thank you. You made a very clear point. And, uh, very, very yes, strong. Please, Richard. OK, thank you very much. Thank for the, the invitations. Yes, I'm uh, Richard John from uh, Cameroon. And uh, regarding the HGV infections, uh, Central Africa is as a epicenter of uh, the HDV infection because we see that we have uh, about 5% of uh, uh, HBV infected people who are inf uh, HGV positive. And uh, we have conducted, let's say 10 years ago, a demographic health survey in Cameroon where about uh, 15,000 people were tested and uh, around 10% were HDV positive. And among those 10% HIV positive, 11% were HGV positive. And there is a very high heterogeneity on HGV prevalence regarding the, the, the region where people are living. But we have about 50%, say 50% of people living in the forest, the, the south and the eastern region of Cameroon, the vegetation there is the forest, and uh, about 50%, one, one or over two percent of uh, HGV are HGV infected. So uh, the challenge that we have is that uh, the HGV uh, diagnostic are not conducted in routine activities. And uh, we have only, let's say, HB uh, antibody testing, but not the RNA, because most of the samples that are positive are, let's say, sent to our refer reference lab in Paris. And uh, a big challenge now is to see how we can, let's say, uh, set up uh, in Cameroon the, 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 the HGV RNA uh, testing because uh, people need it and uh, it's very uh, expensive. And uh, I know that because of this shortage of or this lack of screening in the country, the epidemic is uh, underestimated, very underestimated because more about, let's say, 50% of the people are not aware about the system. So I think that the big challenge is how to decentralize, how to introduce as the uh, RTV rapid test because we don't have it. There is no, uh, most of the HDV rapid testing, even the antibody testing are not available in our country. So 
Thank you very much. That's what I want to say for a moment. Thank you very much. Was a clear point um, you made. Maybe we briefly move to the north of Africa, Manal. If you are there and listening, yeah, the Egypt <laughs> situation might be a little bit different. Yeah, I, I think we have we have almost the same problem because we do not test for Delta uh, routinely uh, unless it's requested by uh, the physician. Uh, if you see something that might indicate testing for Delta, but we do not test for it routinely. Uh, some of the physicians might test, but it's very expensive to test for Delta, uh, even the uh, basic antibodies, uh, not to mention, of course, the, uh, the PCR. So I think the, 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 the diagnostics, uh, it's, a, it's still a big problem in Egypt as much as it is uh, everywhere, else, uh, everywhere else. And I think point of care testing might um, make all sense. But I would like to add not only for Egypt, but for Africa as well, the problem, and I think that's global as well, we don't know the situation in the pediatric population. Uh, we're missing data in the pediatric population, very few case reports on Delta uh, in children and even on mother to child transmission. Uh, when the mother is co-infected with Delta, there are few case reports on transmission of Delta through mother to child transmission. So I think also uh, we need to consider uh, women of childbearing age uh, to be targeted for testing for uh, Delta uh, because they might transmit their infections to their children even after birth. So that's, that's, uh, that's one, uh, one point I think we, we've missed here. And uh, we need to collect better data and collect more data on the pediatric population and even on adolescents if we're contemplating in the future uh, treating those populations. Um, I don't know if... Uh, Pietro can answer a question on when uh, we can um, predict Bluvertide to be available for adolescents or the pediatric population. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't heard about any clinical trials ongoing uh, for antiviral therapy. And I don't think it, it is, it's not available in North Africa as well, and it will not be available, I don't think, in the near future unless we have uh, clear data. Thank you. Maura, if I may, before uh, giving the, the word to, to uh, Stefan that uh, can comment uh, on a few of the issues we, we were discussing, um, uh, there are a couple of questions that I would like to, if we have time to, to, to uh, transmit to, to the panel at the very end. Uh, one is important but that can be uh, answered by Pietro at the same time uh, as the pediatric situation. Is, is there, or, or even uh, the other people uh, in the panel, is there any plan to uh, have a kind of uh, discount access to Boulevardide out of the uh, regions, uh, the EMEA region, or uh, when we, there will be the, the approval in, in the US? Uh, in the US. Is there any plan, any discussion in your, uh, it, this was one, uh, one question from one, one, uh, one of the chat uh, uh, active person that I think is very important. There is any discussion? You are in all these, these. Uh, yeah, Massimo, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the company. So I'm not a, yeah. a representative of Gilead Sciences. So I cannot make any statement of this. What I can tell you, what we know is that the, the company to my knowledge has been uh, in the past, for other drugs, they were able to provide a discounted uh, product in different in areas, including Africa and Asia. So possibly in the future, I don't know. Going back to the question uh, on pediatrics, I'm not aware of any study on pediatrics and Delta and adolescents with bulevertide for now. But I'm sure, I'm sure there will be some studies, but not now. Um, Stefan. Mm -hmm. Your Continue. comments on, on what we was being said, and Einer can eventually later, if he knows something more about Boulevardide availability worldwide, he can step in at the end. Mm -hmm. Maybe also I cannot speak for the company. Of course, everyone is hoping that there are compassionate use programs. There are some compassionate use programs going on, but that will not solve the problem that we are discussing here. Yeah, uh, I mean you will have at least if you give out the possibility to produce that drug in other countries. I mean, it's a little bit of complicated drug, so I don't think that every country can do that. And we will see whether that works. I, I personally hope that, of course, because this is a drug for those that are living in the poorer countries and uh, mostly. Yeah. 
Maybe regarding the, the essay, what, what, what I, I was just, I mean, Nara was visiting us in Heidelberg just last week, yeah, and we were discussing exactly these kind of things. I think it will be very important at the end to have a point of care for both, for S antigen and for anti-Delta. And it works in principle. We've shown that in the paper that has been presented by Fabien. Um, we are developing that point of care essay uh, at the moment. We are for, trying to get that CE certifi certified and get uh, approval. This is on the way. It's not yet there. It is published. There's another publication also where we've done some of the work in China. We think that it, it is very helpful. But we discussed something I personally find interesting and where we can start. In Mongolia, obviously, half of the population has already been screened for S antigen, as far as I understood Nara correctly, or at least a part of the population, or a bigger part of the population. So we could manage to make an ELISA there with this antigen that we produce. So if we could manage to give that antigen out, yeah, for free in those countries where it's needed, where there's no profit delivery of antigen, we could even manage to produce that stuff in a laboratory for screening 200,000 samples that are already there. So I think with an effort, when the when a government would realize that there's a problem, and I thought that this was a problem in Mongolia, that the government just didn't realize with this limited data that there is a real problem. So we need to have a kind of coalition, maybe even ICE, HPV, yeah? One that provides the method, some foundations that put some money in, a willingness of a government to support something like that. We can make something that could start like something in HCV for Egypt with screening the whole country in Mongolia. And then we at least have that. And then we, we can continuously continue with these kind of efforts. Of course, we need support and we need all, all people working together in a kind of for the poorer countries, non-profit way, yeah, to manage that. But it's, I think, manageable. And meanwhile, of course, this, this will be different in, from country to country. When you have to start to screen from the stretch without knowing anything on HPV or HPS antigen, that will be more problematic. But we could start, for example, with Mongolia and with other countries like Pakistan, where there are already data available. That's what we should focus our efforts or bundle our efforts, all that we have and try to get that done. I mean, we are ready to do that and we are starting something with, with NARA in Mongolia. That's what I can say now. Maybe a little bit hope, maybe a little bit too much enthusiasm. Many of you have already been frustrated by some other things, but we can do something. I think so, I'm, I'm positive. And we need the companies that then deliver the drugs. It would be very bad to have the the, the the whole population screened, all the patients ready, and no drug available. This is a certainly an important point. It is important to screen, otherwise we don't cannot realize where the problems really are, the entity of the problem, but then it's the coming the effort to achieve better measure, better measurement, better assay, more affordable assay. That's what the main point that we are talking here. And then, of course, the drug, because even with the uh, boulevardite, we still don't know. There was also a question in the chat, a comment. What do we need about sustained response? What do we need when to stop? This is a very, very difficult issue as well. So mm -hmm. we need to do more and to develop further drugs as well, I think. I think that's a very important point. Maybe, uh, sorry to be so dominant, but, but to add that. With the HCV, we had a limited treatment time and it's easier for a company to say okay we give the drug for, for when I when I know when to stop and I've cured the disease if I need three years and may cure this would also be good we don't know that yet for Budibata. there are indications as we've learned yeah but an important point that we should do is to accelerate the to getting to the to the primary endpoint so that we can stop earlier that's what what also Pietro mentioned if we have predictors that say we can treat for one year and we need for an entry inhibitor at least one year, even if we accelerate that yeah, um, for one year, then we may have the chance to, to, to also improve public health measures because companies are more willing probably to give that drug for compassionate use programs if they don't need to continue. Huh? It's and then important. we are back to the problem of patient stratifications. Maybe, Heiner, you want to make a, knock a small, a short comment? 
Yeah, I think there's nothing to add. Everything has been mentioned. I just want to highlight the, the to me, really critical issues of ethics of testing. So if you identify patients, if you cannot offer anything, then I have a problem in rolling out broad screening programs. Uh, that that's uh, you find arguments still if the patient knows uh, he may behave differently, screening, etc. But uh, we we need to offer something. Yes, we have interferon, and we should not forget interferon even in settings where bulimatide is not available because this has been associated uh, with an improved clinical long term outcome, and that's what I really have to 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 highlight. Therefore, I strongly support testing. Uh, even in the absence of uh, availability of bulimatide. But the, all the other issues have been mentioned. Uh, to my, I just uh, checked clinicaltrials.gov. At least there is no trial in children listed yet. So that's all I can say. Thank you. Nara, small comment. Mm, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the point um, Heiner was making. So it's... Uh, in some ways, it's absolutely true. We have to offer something in order to have you know, identify patients, tell them that you have really terrible disease, and then you don't do anything about it. This is not great. But on the other hand, um, our experience has been that in a country like Mongolia, actually screening and getting people identified and then being able to push the government to do things allocate money to do it to to it it's also quite important for hepatitis c for example we had for a long time peg interferon etc daa coming out we already had in the country at least uh, from our study we estimated 150,000 people with the c living in mongolia but government was not willing to do anything but whereas the patients they actually show okay i have this disease I can see if I go to somewhere else, get cured, then the government actually, despite being low middle income country, it was able to bring out money. It's about priority in a way. So I think this is kind of, um, you should not be too much um, limited about screening. I think uh, getting to know the problem and also pe patients are, when they know their status, they are not going to do stupid things like, I don't know, drinking too much uh, vodka or things like that. So it actually improves the patient outcome in a way. So at the moment, we are, despite we don't have any drug, but we're tied, I think, in terms of the access pricing, we've been discussing with Gilead for a really long time, but not a lot of things happening there. Uh, there has been a lot of um, discussions about what um, price point Mongolian patients might accept. So I think probably Gilead has spent a lot more money to find that out than treating patients in a way at the moment. That's how, as a clinician, I feel. Uh, but the thing is that at least what we can do is that patients, if they can take care of themselves better, like not having nafaldi on top of that, not, not having the alcoholic uh, disease and all that, that sort of things actually improves the outcome. And then the other thing, other very important point in Mongolia is that uh, if the patients are in care, they know they have the disease, they can get diagnosed early for the liver cancer. So that's uh, one of the points that we see quite important. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. I just remind you that we are out, we are behind the time planned, but um, yeah. Okay, just a quick so, point. Very quick. Just a quick and point. It's a catch twenty two. Out, uh, you know, it's a catch twenty two. Ah, you're back. Have, okay. <laughs> it's a catch twenty two. You know, if we don't have data for the prevalence of something, the governments will say to you, "Well, we don't have a problem." So you know, you need to screen to show that we we have a problem in in order to ask for the for the um, antiviral therapy. You know, so it is a bit difficult. Ethically, on the one hand, you can't screen and not treat. On the other hand, you can't convince the governments that you've got a problem if you don't screen. <laughs> That's true. And earlier and more uh, frequent screening might also be very helpful to, to do something. I try to try to avoid um, further aggravation of the problems. But I think we agree and we unfortunately will need to close this very exciting session, I think. 
Um, so if there are not very, very urgent comment, uh, I hope you managed to answer something in the chat. Uh, we try to catch up somehow. And I would say, uh, just to remind you at the end, everybody, that the material will be posted both at the Global Health Organization, ICE, HPV, so stay informed also for future, for the next webinar and other and many different initiatives. So there are, of course, the, the, the communication channels that are increasingly used uh, from this organization, YouTube, you can reach many people using this channel. And there are very interesting video also for patient community to uh, explain, try to, um, of, of course, to, to raise awareness of the disease and what's going on and what uh, uh, the community, the research community, the clinicians are trying uh, uh, to do. So I think that say we are at the end. Oh, I have the privilege to mention also another symposium, ISHBBC organized symposium that will be um, will take place the, at the end of the annual uh, international HPV meeting in Kobe in Japan uh, this year, which will be chaired by uh, Adam Gerin and uh, myself. And I think the topic is also very interesting because we are focusing there on RNA targeting therapy, again, to try to understand the potential determiner of sustained HPV suppression questions that are similar also we've seen today also for HDV. So with that, I would like to thanks everybody. Thank you for uh, uh, joining. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, the all the panelists, uh, all the speaker, the organization, both coalition made a great job that everybody stay connected and get connected. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I am, for the people attending. And uh, I would say Massimo, uh, I don't know if uh, is the Dr. Well, yeah, uh, still there. They are still there, everybody. Last word, the final word. I'm very uh, happy. Just one this point point. for the people that uh, made questions, uh, please reach out because we don't know for some of you how to answer back because uh, the, the chat will not be active after the the, the we have the records, but we have not the way to, to answer back. And uh, if you want to an answer, uh, please reach out to the organizers, the, uh, the Global Hepatitis Elimination Coalition or ICE, and I will make all the speakers that are relevant for the answering answer. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank think, you and, very uh, much. I would, I would like to Imam. also thank the attendees, all the speakers, the organizers, and my co-chairs uh, for, for this. Uh, very important uh, webinar, and thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, for a great bye -bye. session. Bye bye. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.